Strap yourself in because we're set up, switched on, and ready to go. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Survival Guide, Lee. It's great to have you on board. Thank you very much for joining us. So, um, tell us, Lee, we've been talking a little bit beforehand. Tell us a little bit about your story and how did you get into coaching? Okay, so there's two parts to how I got into coaching. Initially, I graduated in 2007 into basically the credit crunch and found myself in a, a graduate position where I was advised, really, there was no potential for development of myself or anything more in terms of you know future prospects until the financial situation looked more rosy. So what actually happened was I kind of took that as a personal message that the most important thing for me to do would be to develop myself. Okay, yeah. So in, in that process, I started investing in developing myself academically and really researching into how I could develop myself if a situation like this arose again where corporate corporates and businesses weren't able to invest in me. So I took accountability for my own personal development and I kind of moved forward with that. Uh, I, start, I started a business in the video game industry right. and that yeah. gave me the income and also the flexibility to study alongside running my business. So that was really helpful because it, what it allowed me to do is study across numerous areas of personal development from fitness to sleep to nutrition to psychology over a period of time, which really benefited me because I was able to apply these concepts to my life and develop and grow as a person. Yeah. Okay. So you had some challenges in life, but I think from there what you're saying is you really envisaged where did you want to go and that you weren't willing to accept some of the challenges that were put before you. And you took accountability yes. for that to design your own life to go wherever it is you wanted to go. Yeah. So it developed further in 2014 because, unfortunately, I suffer from a rare autoimmune disease okay. and it actually left me unable to walk. Oh. So I spent a month in hospital and I was really well looked after. Uh, but, unfortunately, I sus- sustained a lot of damage to my knees due to the swelling. And I was actually found myself being dispatched in a wheelchair, unable to walk and completely reliant on my family and support network. So it, it was a difficult time for me personally. Uh, my son was 18 months old and my wife was pregnant at the time with my daughter. So right. it, looking back now, it was a, it was a challenging time. <laughs> and I, I felt like I went through a lot. I really struggled initially to deal with the fact I'd gone from being very independent, playing sports, you know, being quite social, to having even the most basic tasks of being showered and making food for myself and struggling to do basic everyday tasks. So I had six months physiotherapy, six months hydrotherapy, and a lot of work with my consultant to get my mobility back. And after six months, I was back up on my feet, physically un- unaided, without crutches or sticks. And, I mean, that was five years ago now, and I've continued to work towards being able to, you know, keep my mobility um, and keep myself well and healthy. And, I mean, that kind of cycles into the second point. Because during that process, I had to do a lot of work with myself, uh, both physically and mentally, to try and optimise my life. So I I experimented with my sleep. I experimented with the things I was eating. I was experimenting with the amount of movement I was taking. I was experimenting with so many different things. My my how many my the inputs I took in, uh, in terms of like level against positive to negative, like where my focus was, and really working to optimize my life the best I could. Because yes, I have challenges. But many people have challenges, yeah. and during that time, I didn't receive much help mentally. I have to look back and say, physically, the hospital and my consultant, they did everything they could for me, and yeah. I'm very, very grateful for what they gave me. But mentally, 
I suffered. I was socially isolated. I've been removed from the competitive element of the sports that I played and the teams. I couldn't just jump in the car and go and see my friends anymore. And work-wise, I found myself working from home quite isolated. So I kind of feel that my coaching journey really started at that point where I felt I have these difficulties, but I'm going to be resilient and work through them. And I started to work through them and try different things, pulling back the things I've learned from all the courses that I've done and try to implement them in my life one by one, taking things out, adding things in, seeing what works for me. Yeah, and personally. that really started my coaching journey because I started to realise that it would be incredibly fulfilling to help people who are in a similar situation to me and to work on their lives and to see how in a bespoke way they could get the most out of themselves as well, this, no matter what challenges they face. Yeah, sounds amazing. I can relate to a lot to that because I set up my business in 2009 and it was on a hospital bed as well, just having a setback with one of my kidney transplants, um, well, with the kidney transplant, and um, went through that kind of same mental journey by no means the same uh, challenges that you face and over- managed to overcome, which is awesome. But like you say, that kind of moment in life when something happens and you're at a crossroad and you can go one way or next or the other way. Um, so I think that's rather incredible. What was the beliefs that you kind of set up for yourself that allowed you to start that journey? Because I think that's one of the key areas is having the right beliefs in place. Yeah. What I, re- what I, I really took to heart was when I was on that hospital bed, the doctors and consultants I saw, they, there was differing messages. I saw a doctor and he said, I can see physically you're, you're in shape, so you should be okay. In three months, you'll be absolutely fine. Um, some of the doctors came in and said, oh, look at the damage in your knees. You, you need to prepare yourself mentally for a, a difficult period in your life. You might not get back to where you were. So I kind of, as a, as a kind of like functionally thinking individual, you kind of take those messages and You know, these are people who are trained to give an opinion. So you kind of, you do take it in. But I was adamant that I would be up and running and playing with my children again as quickly as I possibly could. And that was a real driving factor for me. I didn't want to wallow and think of the difficulties. I wanted to take my present situation, make the most of that so that in the future I could attempt to get back to the level I was at and possibly even I was thinking to myself I could rebound resiliently and actually get higher and bounce higher than I was because the sudden like gratitude that you get when you have what feels like something you've taken for granted taken away that rush of gratitude can really help you bounce and actually suddenly you you go above and beyond where you were before because you, you didn't put the boundaries and the limits because you were taking it for granted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I get that. So the, the doctors were almost like the devil and the angel in your internal voice, I'm guessing, on yes. the outside. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty weird. But you managed to find the positive way forward. And what I hear from that is you had a particular reason, which was family and children. Yes. Yeah to push forward I think what might be interesting is since you've gone into coaching what what do you think is some of the ways that people can find that goal that reason to push forward when they've not had a major life-changing event happen yeah and I think that that's something that I've kind of got into because so so many personal development journeys are triggered by a life-changing event so it's it's distilling it for people people will take inspiration from other people's life-changing events but people who've not necessarily had a life-changing event it's getting clarity on the goals and ambitions and the dreams because I feel that 
most humans have a want to actualize the potential and no matter what level they're at even the highest achievers that I've, I've worked with still have more capacity and more to give and want to kind of push forward still and everyone has the barriers and again even even the even the even the high achievers they hit plateaus Mm, yeah they want to push past and the functional coaching that I offer it targets a broad range of disciplines and fundamentals because everyone has a weakness that they, they would you know ultimately like to address if they can see a positive benefit to it on the other side so really coaching is starting to gain a bit of traction in terms of people understanding where the benefits are but we're still very much in the infancy of that yeah very much (laughs) (laughs) people don't often like in a world where coaches are well established such as in the sports field and i've worked in the sports field previously um people don't tend to see all the coaches behind the star players yeah they don't they don't see the team of 10 coaches optimizing different things behind that one celebrity and the hours of deliberate practice that have been uh been applied for them to get to the level where they're performing yeah so when you discuss and look at people's goals and ambitions because so many people don't have clarity on the goals and ambitions See, the first, the first, one of the first things I do as a coach is really delve into people's purpose and the goals, the goals and ambitions that are raised from that. So I believe that really is the starting point because so many people go through life not truly understanding themselves, not really following their own path and forging their own standard of life. Yeah. So when you get people interested and thinking, wait, What am I here to do? What really am I passionate about? If you can distill that and make that clear, they're then a lot more open to changing elements of their life to try and actualize and achieve that. Because they realize, if I actually do that, I'll be fulfilled. So that is how I, as a coach, by distilling a clarity and purpose towards the goals and ambitions, ultimately people... People are chasing a dream. I think the big thing is they need to understand why. Yeah. Because most people have an idea of what they want, but they never truly ask themselves why. And it's the why that will get them through the challenges, the obstacles, and the barriers they face. Do you have a strong enough why? I always always take it that would you would you run across a plank across across two buildings? If somebody give you a thousand dollars, if there was a skyscraper, no. But if those plants were across and the other building had was burning and had family members on it that you could go and save, you'd run across no money. You wouldn't even think about it. Yeah. So it's just that why power is actually the most important thing to these still in clients. Why do they want what they want? So going back to some of the stuff that we talked about um earlier. What we're saying from that then, or what you're saying from that, Lee, is that everybody has a certain pain some way. It might not be a physical element or physical illness that they've been hit with, but somewhere yeah. inside there's a there's a pain because they know they want to go somewhere. And it's about yeah. distilling that down to really understand where they're at the present moment. What building is on fire? And what yes. bu- where do they need to get to? And by clarifying that you move potentially from motivation to inspiration that's correct and i think very nice work (laughs) and i think to me (laughs) to me i've always you're absolutely right in terms of those two buildings you know motivation um particularly in the corporate world for example is your bonus scheme that's that thousand pound that you talked about to get to the other building but what's the inspiration what's deeper down and from what you're saying that as a coach, you really help people to 
articulate that because they know it's bubbling away somewhere but actually being able to put it into words and consciously understand it to use it as a driver is a different level altogether right definitely yeah yeah i think that's it's it's that it's it's finding that for for people and then giving them a framework to help them get towards it because even the most devout and you know routine individual doesn't have the, that level of accountability to themselves that they would have to a coach and they're always slightly no matter how unbiased you try to be you will always be <laughs> you'll always give yourself more leeway than you would if you were being accountable to somebody else yeah, I think we're always hardest on ourselves and we're always easiest on ourselves as well. We're happy to let ourselves off the hook. There's always a little voice that says, well, I can do this tomorrow or actually, do you know what? It doesn't matter so much now, but if you've got a meeting with a coach coming up, you've got to articulate, you've got to say that to them and look them in the eye and all of yeah. a sudden that becomes a very different world altogether, right? Oh, yeah. and it, it, it Like you said, it works in such an interesting way because – most people's negative self-talk is incredibly critical. They would not articulate that to another person. Yeah. But they'll happily say it to themselves. And we've got to be realistic. We have negative thoughts. We're wired to protect ourselves and be secure. So that does trigger negative thoughts. We have to try and find a balance between our negative and positive thoughts. But it's also true that we will we will be easy on ourselves unless we're accountable because that's ultimately there is a level of comfort there and it's pleasant as a human being to be in your comfort zone yes very nice and cozy <laughs> yes <laughs> with a log fire <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice big rug to wrap yourself into so, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Dr. Stephen Peters talks about the monkey brain and, like you say, that fight or flight, we're naturally resp- are wired to feel like we're in the jungle and what's going to protect us and save us versus what's potentially going to put us in danger. Um, so, yeah. like you say, a coach will help make sure that you push forward out of the jungle for trying to continue on an analogy of that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, ultimately, we are, we are a chimp. But we also are human. (laughs) So you've been, you started off your real coaching in 2014, I think, and you've been coaching full time now for the last six months. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, What would you say is the biggest uh, tip that you can give for people to be successful either in their business, entrepreneur life or just their personal life? I think the biggest takeaway for me from, uh, from success, obviously success is different person to person. It's a very individual vision. Um, and that's something that people should also consider defining and why they've chosen that as their version of success. But I think the biggest thing that I've taken is accountability yeah. for your actions and ownership of your decisions, both in the past, in the present and your future direction because really without that it's very difficult to change if you can direct why such a event happened to attribute attribute it or blame it something else it yeah. was this like back for me i could have easily said oh no one's going to train me and there's a credit crunch so there's no money for training i'll just stay in my comfort zone and not improve myself and wait until there is some money in. Um, But it's kind of like you have to take accountability for your life. You have to almost grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it by, grab it by the collar (laughs) and take it, take ownership. It's mine. If if I want something, it's it's up to me ultimately. And I think a big step to that for people is, you need to understand yourself. Okay. Because without that self-awareness and self-understanding, it's actually quite difficult to change it. If you start to understand why you are like you are 
why the past events have happened and how you can actually shape the future because you're mostly in control of it. There's always going to be things out of your control, but it's how you react to those things yep. okay. that you take. And you are always in control of your own actions in your own inner world. And as when you start to realise that, and kind of look back and start to identify why previous things have happened because of you of the actions that you've taken and the things that you thought about it. Because you can in some ways reframe your past and start to understand that actually all these things that happened to me, some awful things have happened to people that they weren't in control of. And it's very difficult to overcome these things sometimes. But you can always take, you know, that little, little, little diamond out of all the rough and realise that, you know, how I frame this situation, how I understand why I reacted that way, I can change that if I understand it. Yeah. And I think that, that's the biggest thing, biggest thing I, I take. And, and naturally, as a coach, not everyone is in a position to be coached. Not everyone wants to be coached. Some people almost revel in the fact that they are struggling. Life is a struggle. And if you if you do truly want to change, you do need to, at a base level, feel that you can and understand that you can. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing to take from me in terms of coaching and success. Okay, so not judging the past per se and being hard on yourself about it but accepting what happened and why it happened and then being self-aware to take different actions better actions maybe going forward and a coach whilst you can do that while you can do that by yourself a coach will help you to accelerate that process and also not just go back into the self-wallowing as well. Yeah. They'll pull you forward yeah. and make sure you're just keeping that self-awareness zone of really going, well, actually, this is what happened and this is what I can do better as opposed to... Exactly. And I think that through, through deep listening, you start to pick up people's, people's ways and methods and how they see the world. And... Using, using that listening, it's then a case of questioning because coaches, coaches' questioning skills are one of the biggest tools that we have, really. If we, can, if we can question people in the right way, it really can open up different avenues and different viewpoints and really make them think. It's questions that you don't tend to ask yourself because, we, we, like again, we always tend to be ready to judge ourselves and be critical of this or to be appreciative but we don't we tend to be looking for answers we don't tend to be asking ourselves of many questions and that's where a coach really can excel by just continuing to question in a non-judgmental environment yeah okay and people tend to open up because they feel safe you know with my clients i have i have open and honest conversations and once you've built that kind of relationship, they are then able to take questions that do probe in different directions, but understand that really as a coach, I am there to help them. Yeah, dedicated to them and their, their goal and their why. Yes, and that's, so, that's the truth of coaching. For, for those that haven't got a coach by the side, and if questions are so vital, um, putting you a little bit on the spot here, what, what do you think is a number one question that potentially people can ask themselves um, to actually start their journey towards the, the other building and get away from the burning building? I, I really think the, the best question to ask is simply, what are my goals? Yeah. Why do I have these goals? Okay, so two questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also why do I have the goals I have? Okay, why do I have the goals I have? Yeah. yeah. 
And then probably just, would you recommend that they use a, do that on a pen and paper, write it down as opposed to fr free flowing it? Because I mean, if you're driving along and you ask yourself, why do I have these goals? The brain can wander off a little bit as opposed to if you're writing them down, that can maybe keep you on track a little bit more. What do you think? Oh yeah, I definitely, I definitely recommend writing down. Like I, I personally reckon, recommend to my clients that they write the goals down every morning. So right. it really, the, the element of writing really solidifies the, the clarity on the goals, but also very early in the morning when we, you know, we woke up and we're awake and we're receptive, is really a great time for us to write our goals down because then we take them with us through the day. Yeah. And we have a tendency to look back on the goals and see if the actions we've taken are congruent with our goals. Yeah, okay, yeah. Because I mean, yeah. it's in the forefront of your mind. So you, yeah. How am I behaving? Is that in, in aligned with my why and my goals that I've read this morning? So it's in the forefront of your conscious mind. Yeah, and that, that's, it. that's the simple way of implementing questioning to yourself because writing them down every day as well you really start if you start like i'm i'm a big uh believer in morning routines okay because I, I honestly believe that how you start your day plays a massive impact on the your level of performance throughout the day and i believe if you really focus in the morning on before you start inputting other people's agendas or other information. So I think they say that 56% of people wake up and look at the phone. It's the first thing they do. They'll look at social media or email or yeah. whatever they were looking at before they went to bed. And this um, doesn't sound, I don't want to name any names, but this doesn't sound like my wife at all. No. We as a... Tend to charge it next to our bed. It's yeah. become like a charge it at the end of the day, which is in itself is not a problem. But I honestly believe that you really do need to start your day asking what you want. Okay. So being in your realm. So I always advise that the, one of the first things my clients do when they wake up is have five to ten minutes of self-reflection whether it's through sitting in silence and thinking, prayer, meditation, or just being mindful and thinking about what they plan for the day. And that ultimately means that you start your day with your priorities yeah. in your realm. Because I guess... Um, sorry, carry on. Yeah, I'll carry on. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess at the end of the day, your life's road, your life's journey is going to be painted out in front of you no matter what. And it, you've got a choice of whether do you paint your own road or do you let somebody paint it for you. And if you're picking up your mobile phone, then Mr. Zuckerberg's probably going to be painting it for you and making that road as opposed to, like you say, using mindfulness to reflect and decide your own journey. Exactly. And, and the beauty in that is, really, people should be designing their own lives. Because that autonomy to do that is one of the biggest things which makes people feel happy. Yeah. To have that control. And in the real world, where many people have nine to five jobs with overtime here and being on email there, that's at least eight hours of your day where you don't have autonomy. So it's really important. And I, always advocate that we should have a morning and an evening routine. Those bookends are the times of day where we have the most control, even if we're even if we're, if we're an employee. So those are the times you have control. So it's really, it's time for you. It's time to, you know, have deep relationships with the people you love. And it's time for your reflection. And we all have different ways of relaxing. But I would always advocate to spend a little bit of time each morning and each evening on on you. Yeah, and, and you're, not saying, you're not saying so. You're not saying there an hour of deep meditation or any fancy 
um, yoga moves where you bend over backwards. Is it? You're literally just suggesting five minutes to actually just reflect and de- and decide what you want and what you've achieved. It's five oh, minutes. Definitely. Yeah, because I think in society we have, uh, we have, we sometimes have a very much all or nothing approach. So the new year will come round, and someone who's got a lot of time stress will say, "Right, I'm I'm stressed, but I'm going to spend thirty minutes doing yoga in the morning and thirty minutes meditating at night." And that that in itself is a lovely proposition, but if we're going to implement new habits and algorithms into our lives that are productive, it needs to be smallified almost. It needs to be so small that you've got no excuse not to do it. You won't talk yourself out of it because it's, it's you know, if you start meditating for a minute or two a day, there's, it's, it's, very, it's actually quite difficult for our brains to say, oh, I don't have time for that. <laughs> yeah. It's very difficult to justify to ourselves Whereas if we try to do things so big at the start, I think the biggest way is these skills work our abilities in the same way that going to the gym and working a muscle would. Yeah. And when we, when we first go to a gym, we're not doing a hundred of an exercise with a really heavy weight. No. We're doing one or two when we first start and we very slowly over the months build it up. Well, really, training our, our mind and our focus is exactly the same. Yeah. And, and really, I think that's a great way to look at it. And I think it's so um, poignant as well, your gym reference there, because that is an awful lot. People really consciously aware that that's massive to prevent physical ailments and keep your physical body in tip-top shape. This seems to be obviously there's a massive focus on mental health at the present moment and how to get over mental health once you have a mental health challenge. But what about stopping it in the first place? And I think what you're talking about here, these routines are ideal things for people to set up and start doing to prevent mental health challenges in the first place from occurring. Oh, definitely. And I mean that meditation is definitely the equivalent of uh, training for the mind yeah. and it's not a, it's not a skill that people will pick up quickly it does take dedication and time but it's it's very much incremental those few minutes every day don't feel like very much but after a few months you'll just feel that little bit calmer and all, and as, as, as the years go by you really can have a difference like if we get one percent better every day it really compounds in a in a in a significant way, and I think that in in a world where people like to try and jump to be a hundred percent better overnight, the co- the compounding interest of small marginal incremental gains, little like if we take out a, if we take out a single bad habit and implement a new one in its place, the difference it can make in your life is amazing. Yeah, but it's. Because it's so small, it just seems insignificant. Yeah. And it is insignificant for the for the short term, but in the medium to long term, it can be incredibly significant. So, again, it's just like not going to the gym and expecting to be ripped the next day. Well, yeah, it's like going to the gym once or a few times and expecting, like, you, you probably take, like, it takes at least a month to see a difference to even the most devoted new routine. Yeah. So it's it's like, yeah, and again, I think the gym analogy works really well because people can see, like, the physical aspect, but it's quite difficult to see you, the, the growth you're making in your neural pathways and the myelin in your brain. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit of a challenge, definitely. Um. So moving forward, with everything that we've just mentioned, what, what do you think some of the biggest challenges are for business owners at the moment um, to face? And how do you think that they should start to overcome those? Is, is this in terms of uh, coaching, coaching businesses or businesses in general? Business owners in general. So I think a lot of our listeners are, are business owners or entrepreneurs, and mm-hmm. they have certain challenges to face in the future that are coming up. 
what do you think some of those challenges might be so that they can anticipate and how do you think they might be able to overcome them? Okay, so, I mean, big challenges that I tend to see, especially for entrepreneurs and smaller business owners, is still the traditional wearing a lot of hats that require a wide variety of skill sets. And from my own personal experience, I've run a small business since 2008, and I've worn a lot of hats over those years as we've had to pivot into different industries and the unfortunate situation with the volatility in Europe has meant recently we've pivoted again. I love the way you said that without mentioning the B word. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but, but ultimately, yeah, I, th- I think that keeping, keeping our skill sets buried and our hats moving is important because we do need to be flexible and use our adaptability because industry changes very quickly and as an entrepreneur on the smaller end of the scale our biggest asset is our flexibility and adaptability um but a big one for me personally as a coach and obviously coaching small business owners is that work-life integration is more important than work-life balance because your business needs you to do your most valuable work at the most productive level you can do. So I quite often work with small business owners who are working incredibly hard, but they are neglecting their well-being. Okay. They're missing out on sleep. Yeah. And because of time constraints, they're eating poorly. They're not... They're not getting the amount of movement they need to. Uh, Some are kind of leaving it aside because they say it makes them too tired to work effectively. Some are going to the gym because they are, again, many entrepreneurs are driven people. Uh, They're going to the gym, but then they are sat down all day, they're sat down all evening. The only actual time they're active over the course of the day is that one hour in the gym and sedentary for the rest of the time, which unfortunately, as is well documented, sedentary is like the new thing you don't want to be if you want to live a long and healthy life. Yeah. So it's it's finding ways to bake these fundamentals in. Because if you don't sleep well, you're probably not going to eat well the next day. You're not going to move enough, and then you're not going to have another night's sleep again. It's going to be boring, and it affects your focus. And suddenly... That work that you're doing, that that you could have done in two hours, takes you three hours, and then you start procrastinating because you're feeling a bit tired. It takes four hours, and then it then it impacts on your on your family time, so you're not spending as much time with your loved ones as you as you could do. And really, as an entrepreneur, you're balancing you know your energy, your work, and your love, yeah. and you need to you need to attempt to integrate all these things so that actually you get time to do everything and live a fulfilling life. Okay. So, yeah, see, you've mentioned there twice the word integration as opposed to balance, I guess. Yes. And that was really interesting. So some of the the biggest challenges that you talked about is that the external environment is changing rapidly and that entrepreneurs and business owners really need to be conscious of that and be flexible in their approach by thinking about the different hats they're wearing at different times and integrating different activities into their day-to-day routine to make sure they're not sedimentary from what you were saying, which I'm quite pleased you said that because I'm at a stand-up desk. So my watch tells me off for standing still at my desk. So that's still not good enough. I still have to move around, right? But but it's those small algorithms that are perfect. I mean, there's there's been a lot of there's been a lot of research into it recently. Uh, John Vertikos, who worked with NASA, okay. she was in charge of the space launch, and she wanted to know why the astronauts were aging so much, and it was because of the effects of being up in the space station, uh, not subjected to gravity. Now, being not subjected to gravity is similar to sitting on a chair. Yeah, because. You're not, you're not moving, so you're not subject to the forces. So 
they're saying there was a significant amount of ageing due to effectively sitting in a chair, which is why a stand-up desk makes a big difference because you're now subject to gravity. Yeah. And those forces... Of course, it's telling me I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> moving around. It's just like, so I think from that whole period, people... There's so much value that you've given throughout that. And it, it, if people listen to this podcast even once or twice, they'll probably pick up some fantastic um, tips and value that you've offered, Ellie. So that's incredible. Um, tell us a little bit about your business specifically and how people can get in touch with you um, to try and get some of this support that you're telling us about. Okay, so I'm available on most social media channels. We are at Essentialize on Twitter and we are at Essentialize Coach on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Uh, we have a website which is www.essentialize.co.uk. Okay. And we do have Yeah, and we do have a blog there where there's content going out on similar topics, especially surrounding uh, digital minimalism. Uh, morning and evening routines uh, we do quite a lot on habits rewiring and in all, uh, using algorithms to input uh, things into your life and take things out and it's a really valuable skill for people to learn like if then implementation so that's something that we're really big on and yeah we just we really focus on making an impact and getting people to make little changes which make a massive difference to their lives. Cool. So they can find John across all the social media channels. We'll put some links um, in the podcast description on the blog so they can find you. And what you mentioned there was everything pretty much that you've mentioned throughout this podcast, they can find out more detail and more information about that and get in touch with yourself to accelerate their success. Indeed. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much for your time today, Lee. Really appreciate it. Um, And look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thank you, Martin. It was a pleasure. If you haven't already, subscribe on iTunes. And while you're there, please leave us a rating and review.